where we ended last week, uh, we were going from a client side JavaScript to R and then from R to JavaScript. It was, it's literally pointing both directions. So I had covered from R to JavaScript. That was a, a piece that was finished. And let me make sure I'm using my right microphone. Okay, good. Um, my other setup you can see behind me, unfortunately, is from that other presentation. I didn't move it fast enough. So um, I'm using the headset. It comes across a little bit more tinny uh, in, your, in your tone. Calling JavaScript from the server side, uh, for example, R, is done by defining a series of custom message handlers uh, functions. These functions are uh, one argument that can be called using the sessions send custom message. Now, I'm repeating myself from last week's presentation. What this was doing is establishing a R to JavaScript uh, uh, relation. I'm going to scroll down a little bit further, and I ended the conversation from a JavaScript perspective to R. I needed to populate this. Um, so if you realize that the custom message handler within our R code is relating to the document object model or to the uh, namespace ID of that JavaScript runtime, what we're doing in this next example is taking it from the JavaScript or browser's perspective and then sending a message back to the R kernel or to the server itself, all right? And the way that we achieve this activity is through the shiny runtime object. Even within the code that I'm presenting right now for our knitted uh, output, if I were to jump dump into the uh, uh, browser dev tools, I would be able to access this shiny object. Now, the reason I'm calling it calling the term object is because it can be anything, right? So you're just manipulating it. You're adding extra plugins to it to uh, get data back out of that JavaScript runtime, okay? So the function from the shiny JavaScript object allows the register an input name and value. The example we have is shiny.set input value, and then we're giving it a random uh, naming convention and then applying a math.random uh, uh, function. JavaScript function. You bind the input, which can be cut, uh, sorry, caught. Uh, I misspelled that. That's supposed to be, can be caught from the server side using the UI, or excuse me, the server side handler uh, by using an observe event. Okay, so going back uh, to the relationship of our UI versus the server, uh, the two components of browser-based document object model versus the uh, server that is uh, your web server providing this information. What we're doing is now manipulating the JavaScript runtime environment to create an object, and then we have to receive it on the server side with that observe event. Does that make sense? Okay. The shiny uh, set input value can be used inside any JavaScript function. As an example, we're using the following code snippet. Um, this is a reference to a Golem application. So inside your inst app dub 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 uh, directory, we're gonna have this script.js, okay? So we're creating a function called alert me. We are uh, uh, adding a variable name prompt, uh, who are you? And then a alert message return of hello, input name, welcome to my app. The shiny input value is created using username and then the object name. So the way the function works is we're waiting for the shiny object to be connected uh, within the document, uh, shiny connected, and then the function, the event. Um, we have this object or this function that we just created, alert me, uh, available. So we're just calling on that creation. Then we have dot shiny plot output on click provide the function, uh, calling the alert uh, alert me function with the ID of the clicked plot. Uh, the this object here refers to the clicked element. Um, and by the way, Frederica and Russ, this is a copy and paste out of the textbook. So this code snippet that I'm working with uh, is also in your same. I'll even zoom in. Um, it's it's the same uh, reference that we have. Uh, within our, does that work? Yeah, there we go. 
just increase the size of the font a little bit. Okay. Now, the way this object was intended to work is that we have the shiny, uh, shiny runtime server. We've, we've ran our app. We've created the server object and the UI object. As the UI says, I'm going to add this additional function called alert me. When I click that button, it's going to call from the server uh, the last uh, supplied media. Uh, this goes back to our concepts of caching um, or, or just direct uh, handshake with the server. We're doing this from the browser's standpoint, uh, requesting from the server uh, some information. Okay, And so the return to this, uh, the above snippet gets the username and last plot clicked. We can catch that call to the server using the following snippet. Now we're switching back to our R code side, server side, by using that observe event. We're using the input username and then command line interface, uh, cat rule, username, and then we're gonna print that back. The same can happen with our uh, last plot clicked. Um, I Did I run this plot in our last presentation? Um, I couldn't recall in memory whether I was interacting with the DOM itself. I had dropped into DevTools and was doing a bunch of funny uh, command line uh, console inputs, JavaScript console inputs. But I remember that it was, it was some kind of a shiny app that we were running as an example. Do you re remember what that was? I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember no, uh, a, a, an interaction with a plot, to be honest. Uh, no, I don't have... either. <laughs> what what I believe Mr. Colin Fay is doing here is he's got a shiny app, and that by adding these additional features to that example, then it renders the output. Um, if I went back above and and found that particular shiny app code snippet, I could probably get this up and running, but. Um, I didn't try it myself. I typed all of this out uh, yesterday evening uh, and this morning before the call. So um, I'm doing a lot of copying and pasting and that's probably not a good thing because I'm not interpreting what the, what the message is doing or uh, showcasing how it actually works. But understand that the shiny object is part of the document object model. It's part of the JavaScript runtime. So as a client side use, we are able to add additional script that would send a message back to the server and then reply back with, uh, sorry, catch that message and then respond back with whatever output we're, we're providing. Okay. I guess my, my reasoning for delineating between server and client side, I'm referring to R as being the server and the client as being JavaScript. So the message exchange between the two. What will end up happening within our Golem runtime is we're going to pass back the username being Colin, the last plot clicked was plot A, and then the last plot clicked, if you were to do this again, would be output plot B. Without having the actual Shiny app to generate and interact with it, um, I'm only doing this from a code snippet standpoint, uh, copy and paste standpoint. I did add a note down here. Um, as, a, as a synopsis from the author, uh, if you're using modules within Golem, you will need to pass the namespace variable ID to be able to get that information back from the server. Um, last week, Russ, I remember you and I were exchanging, uh, I was talking about the namespace ID and that uh, I said, it's kind of an ephemeral number. It's an assignment by the document object model. We don't know from a server's perspective what that numbering sequence is. By passing the namespace ID, the resolution of that arbitrary number can be received back. Um, so if we were using modules within our golem and that we were calling on this, we would have to use that namespace uh, line of text as well. Um, this was important from last week's Mastering Shiny course because uh, we, we touched on security and the namespace ID of being a potential manipulation point kind of a middleman attack type, type concept, okay? All right, so this can be accomplished by using the session NS, meaning NS stands for namespace function. This comes by default using any Golem generated module. 
Um, if you were not using Golem, you would have to create this uh, identity yourself. Ultimately, the text that I really want everyone to focus on is this NS equals, sorry, NS defined NS ID. Okay. If working within the Golem package management concept, when you create a module, this is already applied. If you were just doing a Shiny app outside of Golem, you would have to create uh, or remember to use this particular line of text. Right. So let's talk about what's going on here. Within the document, this is JavaScript, this first part, or actually it's jQuery with the, with the dollar sign in the front. Manipulating the document dot ready function, setting a custom handler that will ask the user for their name, then set the return value to the Shiny input. Within the Shiny object, this runtime object, we're saying Shiny add custom message handler, who are you? And then we're calling it function arg. The variable name by prompt or what we're going to display as a radio button would say, who are you? The Shiny set input value is the argument.id, which is going to be here used in a moment for the namespace. Going down into the R side of the code, we have mod, my first module UI, function is ID, namespace is NSID, tag list action button, show name, and then say enter name. Mod, my first module server function is input output session. So we're generating our session layer, accessing the namespace variable, and then assigning it session namespace. So again, my statement a moment ago, I said these are kind of ephemeral, they're, they're, they're uh, generated at runtime. So it's not a known point that I can call on as a static value. I have to work within this object of ID and namespace so that I'm calling on the correct value and then populating it back to the server. Does that make sense? It does make sense, but it's um, it, it comes as a surprise to be honest. Because I thought, um, I to be honest, I thought um, the the namespace, the IDs used in Shiny were kind of predictable. That you like you you passed in a value, and that became the ID for the module that you pop. It say you're a kind of parent it, module, and that's... you're. Uh, where was that line of text at? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, where we're calling it like show name as an example, mm -hmm. like observe event show name. These are known yeah. uh, values that the developer is putting in. Um, I believe the reference that I'm hoping to access is more on the CPU's management of that ID. Yeah, cool. Um, cool. There's only been one time where I where we've accessed it, and I don't recall what chapter it was that we were in, but uh, we had to drop in and find out what the ID of assignment was. We don't have any idea from a server client standpoint because it's on the client's side. The client can be anywhere or any form of browser. It's as that uh, uh, HTTP uh, or HTML is rendered, uh, compiled, uh, is when we start to assign those uh, uh, numeric values by using the namespace ID. We're calling on the same topic without actually knowing what the value is. In the existence of Golem, uh, with that observe event input show name, uh, we can evoke the JavaScript, who are you, and then provide a list output uh, with ID namespace and then the name of that uh, user. On the server side, we have the observe event input name and then uh, command line. Uh, I don't, CLI is not command line. It's uh, client. I think it's rep the term represents client, forgive me. Uh, client uh, username is and then print the user's name. Well, um, CLI, it's, uh, I mean, it's a it's a cram package, it, it, but it's just a. It is. It's a, a tidy way of printing stuff to the command line. It, it, I think it really does relate to the command line interface. It's it, it, okay. its name, um, but yeah. 
Uh, so what I what I believe is happening, and, and Russ, during your cash presentation last uh, two, two weeks ago, I think this was a topic that we had in hand uh, of being able to store memory and, and optimize your 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 uh, communication. When I'm saying it's this arbitrary value, or I'm I'm calling it this namespace ID, um, I don't know in memory what it has been assigned to store that variable, but by accessing the namespace ID and the runtime, the service automatically knows what that value represents. And so we're passing it back. So this uh, uh, command line interface cat rule user is, and then we're calling on input name. Well, we've already assigned what that name is back here with that namespace ID. So if my client is saying, I've got a, 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 a an action button, right? on my web browser, I select that action button uh, labeled uh, a show name and then having it with a title of enter name. When they select that button, it's making a, a, a call back to the server saying, who is your existing uh, person that's uh, accessing this and then passing it back over. Um, I think there's a component here where I'm creating an input so I, I have to have a box to be able to type this in um, and then execute by hitting the action button. So the, the, the variable namespace ID is what would be populated as a reference to access that memory location or that, that, that uh, uh, assigned value in that memory location, pass it back. I think I'm probably being really confusing with my explanation here. Um, in my brain, I, I comprehend how this exchange is occurring by not knowing the namespace, but yet still accessing the value that's, that's uh, provided, stored in that location using the namespace ID call, I can, access that memory, um, populate its location, receive its, its value. I'll go back and do uh, some more research on this namespace concept and then provide a little bit more correspondence on how it's managed within the uh, communication paths, the send and receives between our server and, and client. Sure. I'm wondering whether it this is whether the 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 way that the server functions are written in engineering shiny is the old style of yes it, that is a yep that is a topic. Like because I'm, I'm sure that the IDs are passed into um, a, a kind of a function that constructs a module server now in Shiny. So See? the ID, uh, the namespace ID is, is, is available to code within a server function now. Uh, I might be mistaken, but I know, I, I'm fairly certain that that was the case. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, I didn't mean to put it. Um, no, that's okay. But it is difficult stuff. <laughs> so well, it it's these are not touch points. I guess is the the hardest difficulty in in comprehending or or constructing what exactly is going on between the client browser handshake. So you've got this this um, two part send and receive concept that's happening between client and server um, when we are using the languages of, you know, uh, uh, input value or, you know, set input value or uh, the observe event uh, uh, return uh, concept. What is allowing that transport of media from client to server and then server back to client again? Uh, and that's where the HTTP comes in. That's where your, your document object model handshake and, and all of its relation comes in, um, et cetera. 
Okay. I'm going to scroll down to the next topic um, because that's going to be related to uh, uh, Shiny JavaScript. So there is a package called Shiny JS. Um, it was authored or maintained by Dean Atali. Um, Dean Atali is the same user that uh, wrote the TimeViz package. If you've ever witnessed me use TimeViz before, um, I can even pull up a, an example if, if the team is curious and want to see it. But the uh, Mr. Atali does a lot of work in the uh, world of JavaScript and HTML. Um, so his manipulation is a little bit different than Mr. Mr. Colin Faye's with the package management of Golem. Um, I don't know Mr. Atali directly. Um, I'm only referencing because I see his name come up quite often in relation to Shiny services. Uh, but let me open up this web page real quick and I'll, I'll show you what I'm referring to. Uh, let's pull this tab over. And so Mr. Dean Atali is the, is the individual that wrote this giant, uh, Shiny JavaScript uh, uh, package. When used within our Shiny services, it encapsulates or makes it a little bit simpler and easier to write JavaScript uh, within your uh, uh, code base. There's a statement that is repeated over and over again that if you don't know or understand what the function is doing, that you probably shouldn't deploy it. Uh, and the, the, the comment there is mainly related to, to security and uh, preventing somebody from accessing a server uh, uh, pwning a server, making it into a, a zombie. So the Java runtime package allows for a more concise and, and secured manner. Uh, we have a confidence level that the code base has been uh, tested and assured that it's not going to uh, create a vulnerability uh, within our, our Shiny app itself. Okay. Go back out here real quick. And let's go back to our presentation. There we go. So as mentioned at the beginning of the chapter, running JavaScript code you don't really fully understand or comprehend can be tricky and may open up vulnerabilities. It is always safer, always, always safer to use proven packages that have been tested in past efficiency. By using the JavaScript or uh, Shiny JS library from Mr. Dean Natali, we are gaining confidence the fact that if we deploy a snippet from this package it's not going to open up any potential uh, middleman type uh, scenarios where somebody can start uh, accessing our server and, and gaining root access okay uh, and then the second is if you want to deploy this uh, there's another third link uh, that will take you to a different uh, uh, site i don't think these are the same are they I'm going to open that link real quick. Now, I guess it is the same link. I'll delete that second uh, repeat. So in one case, I'm embedding a hyperlink to a, to a named uh, anchor. Um, here, I'm actually just uh, posting the, the web URL as well. All right, this last topic is my favorite. Um, I'm very much still learning about APIs in general. Um, Russ, I have reason to believe in your profession that you may reference APIs probably a lot more than others. Uh, Frederica, as more, uh, the profession that you fulfill, I'm sorry, um, you may pull from data sets, I guess. Um, APIs are nothing more than a language that allows uh, one, operating systems runtime to access another's. So you get a lot of get and put type commands going back and forth. Okay. Um, APIs are very, very useful. However, uh, in most cases, so that you're not uh, completely uh, running a server into the ground, they will limit based on the IP address, the number of calls made. Well, this is very inefficient. So the topic of discussion here is the cost of that limit. Um, I don't want to continually access a Twitter API downloading tweets, or I don't want to access uh, the Google Maps API, you know, where I'm limited or charged by the number of calls I'm making. 
So instead, let's put that cost back on our user base that is running this, this Shiny app, right? Or accessing the Shiny app. By making it into a JavaScript function, I'm now putting that limitation onto, or I'm offloading that limitation to our user base, not to the server deploying it. Make sense? So as an example, if you are limited by an API call, Twitter or Google is a great example. Uh, I think in Twitter, you can only make, I think it's 18,000 downloads in a minute or an hour. There's a limit that you can uh, pull and then it'll time out for you. You have to wait a while uh, before you make another call. On the Google API, I think it's a thousand calls before it starts to charge you money uh, uh, to, to deploy the Google API, Google Map API. Due to these restrictions, your end users may be limited in using your app. So instead, a workaround is wrapping that uh, concept of API call into a JavaScript so that the IP address of, of use is on the user, not on the server. We can do this by using the fetch command. JavaScript function to make API calls. For an example, we're creating a tags button that says get one. And then on click, I'm going and getting a random beer. Uh, this was Mr. Colin Fay's example. Uh, below is a general skeleton of how this API call works. Uh, it is not required authentication, but returns a JSON object. Inside the JavaScript, uh, we create a function that will be available on a click event. So function definition is going to be a constant get random beer. And then inside that function, we're saying fetch from this web URL, HTTPS API, punkapi.com, and then uh, V2 beers random. What we do when we receive the data is on acceptance, we're going to uh, populate the object data. Uh, this is going to be a JSON element. Uh, Data.json, then assign it to res. Uh, send the JSON to R using the shiny set input beer res priority as event. And then we define if this uh, fails to uh, get the API uh, and that's just catching error. And then it uh, uh, populates an alert that says error catching result from API. Okay, on the server's side, okay, we were sending the JSON element uh, with this uh, uh, set input value beer. On the input side, observe event, input beer, and then we would have to do something else with that JSON data. And that's what this next element is telling us. Uh, the data shared between R and JavaScript is serialized JSON. Um, so you'll have to manipulate it and format it once you're received in R, but we've got plenty of packages that would allow us to do that too. Uh, da uh, Data.table, um, there's a, a JSON uh, inside uh, dplyr that you can manage with. And then the hyperlink says you can get more information about the fetch command uh, from, from this URL. But what I wanted to do real quick for the team is I did run this web URL and I wanna show you what it returns. So I was having a topic with a coworker um, in reference to APIs and uh, how to manage them or how to use them. Um, the, individual was unfamiliar with what a JSON object returns. So let's go control V, enter. Now I can refresh this multiple times and it's just gonna continually change the uh, returned object, this JSON element object. But we can see that the ID number is 231, um, name of the beer is Ace of Chinook, tagline single hop session IPA, right? And then you're getting all of these uh, I guess, uh, uh, elements inside the JSON uh, file. Once we pass this into our, our server and then do uh, any other manipulation with it, um, we would have to, to manage how to deconstruct this list of lists. So, so Frederica, have you, have you used APIs in any of your, any of your current Shiny apps at all? Um, that's for maybe downloading data, yes. fetching the data from a website, okay. and um, 
Um, so use it inside the app for making a plot and then transform uh, the data set in a way that they can download it. Okay. Uh, but there no, I haven't used it for, for example, I've tried the, the Twitter API, uh, so getting the access and everything to see how it worked, but then didn't use it. So I know that I, some. Yeah. I know that some IPAs require authentication, uh, or there's a there's a security wrapper that goes around. Um, that is another element that is outside of this chapter. is is more of like the use of APIs kind concept. Um, I started to I started to use APIs when I was. Uh, uh, interacting with an Elastic Cloud, uh, Elastic Search uh, instance, um, I would pass certain criteria, uh, and the the entire language is all API derived. So I would pass particular criteria to the Elastic Search. It would return back this JSON file. Um, what I found I had to do was either flatten it so that I could uh, deconstruct the list of lists and create an actual data frame with it. Um, I was working towards attempting to achieve a data.table, uh, so it was a little bit more efficient in management. Um, Russ, in your profession, I left you at the end. I would assume, based on the criteria that you work with, API calls are almost a cornerstone of your, your service. Uh, no? Uh, probably not. No, 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 not me personally, no. Uh, certainly, because... Uh, okay. uh, uh, I mean, um, like, uh, uh, ob I obtain a lot of data from like FTP sites and things like that, but it's a it's a slightly different um, process, really. Management, so th right? Th this would be um, certainly. I mean, uh, I I can see how it's quite it, it's it's similar in some ways, and that you're rather than obtaining um, um, uh, rather than reading data from a CSV on a server somewhere right. or right. Uh, just pinging um, an alternative server and it sends you back some data in a particular form. I, I rarely use JSON and um, um, for, as a media type, uh, yeah, as a as a way of getting data. But yeah, I, I I have no doubt that that will change. That's probably just because I've only really done this job for um, well, you know, eight months or something. But um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, in in bioinformatics, we used to do we used to obtain data in a similar way. But like a lot of the time, the 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 handling of the data structures the the restructuring and things like that which is the complicated part really for a lot of these apis is in in bioinformatics was already there were already libraries and packages that would do that and there would be like um kind of standardized formats of data so it's it the the actual challenging part of dealing with these APIs was not really something I uh, did much of then, the, but uh, yeah, the I can see I can see that the the, the 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 structure is kind of something that I would be able to work with. The, is is there a concern though that you know if your client is doing the um, API calls and then sending the data? From their browser oh, to your R server. Good point. Yeah, because you could in, you could potentially ingest malware with that use case, correct? Yeah. Well, it, that, that, but then again, presumably anything that they pass from their browser to your server could do the, the, the cause the same kind of security well, issues. So, I, I guess it's not a selection. You're as the developer utilizing the API call of another service, you're offsetting the cost of like uh, access tracking uh, back to your back to your client uh, so that you, uh, 
as an example, if I'm calling on the Google API and it says I can only make, you know, a, a thousand calls in a minute, right? So, but I've got a hundred thousand users that are, are connected to my Shiny app. Um, that's going to be a very, very large limitation. Mm. By wrapping it in a fetch command, the client's IP, the browser's IP, the, the user that's connected to the server, by utilizing their IP address, I can replicate or, or scale the amount of calls that I can make to that, to that Google API. So if I got 100,000 users, then I would be adding a multiplier of 1,000 calls per user. Um, I could really increase the volume of, of, of uh, access. And it would be more localized to the, to, the, to the client, not to the server. I really don't care yeah, yeah. Um, how many people are uh, probably at some level concern myself with the amount of traffic that I'm receiving. But um, there's, a, there's a discussion and it has nothing to do. And I apologize. I'm in many of the topics, I merge the two cohorts together. So I do want to apologize for that statement, but um, I'm going to be presenting the performance chapter, the last chapter of Mastering Shiny. And there's a, uh, there's a uh, uh, RStudio uh, 2019 R talk that is referenced in that chapter. And they were talking about um, spamming, spamming servers. Uh, the topic was, uh, you know, for whatever reason, he was calling them whales. And he said that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, this, this one server is downloading 60 gigabytes of data, uh, or uh, I think it was 60 gigabytes um, at a particular point in time. And he goes, this is just weird. Like that's, that's not normal. Why would you download that much packages? Uh, that's like almost the entire volume of CRAN being pulled down uh, by this one instance. So the relationship that I'm referring to here with, with using the client's side JavaScript fetch command is it's their IP address, not the servers that is, is uh, being limited. So I had a, a quick use case as an example of this, the topic I was referring to with my, my cohort uh, or my co-member, uh, co-worker. We were talking about a geolocation versus the weather that was being applied at that geolocation. So we have a data stream coming from a uh, vehicle, an asset. And during that ingestion uh, population, it was also going off with the geolocation to a weather, using a weather API server, and then populating additional uh, uh, SQL database with um, that particular instance of, of weather for that scenario. This could be vital information, especially if you're dealing with you know, very cold wintry conditions or maybe uh, uh, very hot summertime conditions if maybe cooling is a, is a topic. Um, we use this in troubleshooting uh, the, uh, the vehicle's environment. And so, the, but it was an API call that was populating this. And so when we were looking at the data, not all of the, not all of the values were populated with this API call. And he was curious why. And I said, well, it's probably just a logical piece, right? It's not important. This is more of just an informative message. I don't need to report back all of this additional uh, labor and cost of acquiring this API uh, data to populate the server. But anyway, just a, an example of how you could use that. Uh, uh, what beer means in this context? Uh, what, uh, it's, it's a type of beer. Uh, alcoholic beverage type of, of beer. So if uh, I is refresh- that, Is that a beer, the, the drink? It is, it is. Um, it, okay. I bet you there's a manufacturer in here. Um, I mean, there's a function, which is uh, get run the beer. Uh, no, it's not a, it's not a function. Uh, the author, Mr. Colin Fay, is just providing an example of a non-restrictive, non- -restrictive, non uh, so he made the function Secure APIs. Uh, and say yes. that he's fetching the beers. Yes, yes. If I, right. if I refresh, if you look at this ID number 231 and I refresh my browser, you can see that it changes now to 122. Uh, if I refresh the browser again, it changes to 153. So all I'm doing is randomly uh, uh, sampling these, uh, this data set using an API call, randomly sampling this server's list of, of beers. 
Yeah, because um, I thought that was uh, a function and fear. I know that fear is fear, but uh, oh, I yeah. thought that was uh, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, something that with, with a, a different meaning for, for oh, the I see. of the function of, yeah. Well, uh, I think, I, yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, um, um, I put uh, the link um, in the chat so you can see. Ah, very good. Excellent. Uh, the remaining topic of this chapter for the time that we have together, um, uh, there's a statement about using the bubble package. Um, and so this is a, another um, reference to a, a Node.js runtime. Um, I found this very fascinating. Um, I haven't started to develop in Node.js yet, but I do utilize the service of Node.js in some other uh, uh, generated material that I author, um, both in Reveal.js and another open source subject uh, called the Adapt Framework. Uh, you can uh, uh, populate uh, this media uh, and then using Node.js as a runtime create your own instance of a server to interact with it and test it. So what I'm, what I'm seeing this bubble package doing, uh, it is on GitHub. I don't, I don't believe bubble is in CRAN. Uh, I didn't go and search. I can look real quick while we're together. No, it, it comes with a few warnings at the start. So I imagine it, does. it okay. isn't on CRAN. It says disclaimer, this is a work in progress. So uh, there you go. All right. So I, I think it is just a, a, a dev tool or, or a dev a download from a GitHub repo, Mr. Colin Faye's repo. But um, you can, I, I didn't understand. So the, the knitting operation is obviously producing your HTML output. Uh, so bubble set node engine. Um, I believe is that setting your version of Node that you're calling on. Um, the statement at the above says obviously you have to have Node.js loaded onto your machine for this bubble package to operate. But um, Node.js is actually a C library that generates JavaScript uh, runtime. So Node by itself is kind of a it's a misnamed topic. Um, when you're developing in, in Node, it's actually C library calls, but uh, it's extremely efficient. Um, and the other topic I just want to throw in, if you are in a Node development world uh, or watching this video about Node, is uh, there is an infinite number of environments. Uh, you have to be very careful with Node.js that uh, you're going to... You Say that again, I'm sorry. No. Oh, there you go. I said I didn't. I didn't hear your uh, your reply. So, what did you say? Uh, forgive me. Uh, Node.js is uh, uh, if you run an older version of Node, there is a possibility of a huge amount of security vulnerabilities, um, and the uh, development of the Node.js uh, uh, service uh, is in a constant evolution, uh, almost to the hour. Um, you're getting constantly notified that there's a new uh, version of Node that has been deployed. So um, if you are in that topic of runtime environments or, or coding in Node, um, you always have to take that into account. When uh, uh, You may have to update your system just to run a particular piece of code. The set Node engine, I have reason to believe that that's telling you what version of Node to populate with. Um, or it's just a reference to start a Node.js uh, I, interaction between R and Node. I think that it, it, I think you I think you only use that to um, so that you can write Node chunks within a Markdown document. Oh, I see. And okay. have them sent and, and evaluated by a Node ah. runtime. That um, so would make sense it then. would be something uh, so equivalently if you're um uh, yeah i mean it's all done in the background now by nitar but like you uh, if you were to use a python engine you'd have had to have um explained how to find it on your system and things like that but now Good nitar point. does that for you and, and whatnot anyway, excellent but yeah i see that and then the last one was the node replace but um 
I'm not familiar again what this is referring to. Uh, it, 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 unless it's changing your environment, like selecting a different version of node runtime. Um, I, I didn't, in the time of generating our presentation, I didn't have an opportunity to go uh, look up some of these calls to gain a, a reference of what uh, the service is doing. But node replace, it just says it's I, a straightforward. Well, I... Uh, sorry, I, I think that's actually um, what that will do. If you're in R, in okay. like the, the you know the R session window, and you type in Node REPL, it will open it. Um, you'll be able to work in an R session, but all the code that you write is evaluated by Node, and the results it creates are printed to the command line but the command line is basically your R session it's it's REPL rather than replace it's the read evaluate print loop I see thank you for correcting my uh my use of of the term uh that does make sense now so it it, it it's allowing the R studio IDE to interact from command line with node directly then like a Java notebook sort of, not, I'm sorry, Jupyter notebook or R Markdown book concept. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, the last statement, and, and we are at time, but uh, the last statement I was going to make, I had these posted from last week, all of our references. Um, the GitHub repo of the um, engineering shiny gray production apps, the document and these references are on GitHub. Um, I'm just copying and pasting them back here. What I did notice though are, I'm familiar with quite a few of these. Um, I do use them quite often, but I didn't realize that I could deploy them in an RStudio type fashion or a Shiny type fashion. Um, one of my favorites that uh, you will find, it does step into this topic in a, a, a path of learning. So the you know, novice version of JavaScript, the intermediate, you know, knowledge person, and then the advanced user concept. I, I found these helpful. And then the last one is this uh, advanced use is the eloquent JavaScript. Um, if you haven't uh, sampled that book, it is vast in its, its uh, <laughs> amount of material. It is a really yeah. big document and a, a really good document to, to have at your fingertips. So. <laughs> Yes, I, I have a, like a 10 year old version of it. I don't, yeah. think, it's, I don't think it's of much use anymore, to be no. honest. I think it was um, out of date within two years, the uh, the version I've got of it. But um, right. yeah, uh, no, it is a really, really good book. But uh, yes. uh, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> and I don't know, uh, both of our, uh, Russ and, and Frederica, both, I don't know if you've ever exercised or went into a protocol documentation before, it can be difficult to read or comprehend what it's doing. Um, and it's, it's helpful to have another uh, user explain exactly how to reference these functions or reference these particular calls. Uh, that's what a lot of the eloquent JavaScript does. You can drop in and go to ECMAScript directly, you know, select your version that you're deploying and, you know, read all of its documentation, but it's, it's very labor intensive and, and possibly confusing. So by going with these other URLs, these other scripts, um, it's much easier to comprehend. I use the Mozilla JavaScript quite often uh, in the WC3 schools if I'm ever curious um, what a particular line of text is doing um, for interpreting. Um, I'm almost zero knowledgeable on jQuery, surprisingly. Um, this is a little bit of a unicorn for me. Uh, the comment is actually opposite for most JavaScript developers. You start out with jQuery and then you expand your knowledge into the JavaScript world. So I need to go the other way around. So. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm having a look at the uh, JavaScript for cats uh, website. It's very, Is it? um, <laughs> it's very cute. <laughs> but, uh, which um, that was one of the first or second that's, links. Uh, it's it? one of the basics ones. It's ah, uh, uh, oh, there we go. JavaScript yeah. for cats. 
pull that over real quick. I guess it's a way to uh, <laughs> uh, make learning easier, having a reference to apply thought to. So, either way. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, uh, we're getting towards the end of the book on, on both cohorts. Um, uh, yeah, I got the book open here. So we have, I guess, chapter 18, and then it goes into a bunch of appendices. Um, is there, do you have a plan for that, either Frederica mm, or, or Russ? Not really. I, I was certainly, I was planning to do chapter 18 myself, unless you, you want to do it, Frederica. Um, Appendix A is, um, I think it might be worth going through the contents of Appendix A in two weeks' time. Because uh, it it does cover little bits from every chapter that we've studied, um, but it might be too much to do in an hour. Uh, but okay. we'll just see what we can study. Because uh, because there's I mean the stuff within it about deployment and stuff like that that probably I I wouldn't want to cover in. Um, I don't. But, do we have yeah. a Golem application in our repo. Um, I can go look real quick. I don't think so, no. Um, but yeah, it, it, it would be nice to cover that because it's like yeah. an end-to-end -end use of Golem. And really, like, a, a lot of the stuff that we've touched on, I, I thought that this book was going to be very, very Golem-centered. <laughs> and a lot of the content that's been covered you could use in a more typical shiny app uh, and uh, in, in many ways you could use the 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 the, the teachings from it regardless of what language what web framework agreed um uh, so yeah it would be nice to have um a bit more of a insight into how to use Gollum. And I think that appendix probably would cover that. But next week, yes, I'd like to do the CSS chapter. Outstanding. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was trying to find my my screen again with our chapters. Um, I believe Master Shining, uh, Mastering Shiny is is going to be closing up. We may have a couple of weeks to cover that chapter twenty three. Um, Russ, I don't really remember if you gave that presentation the last cohort or not. I think I gave um, almost I, every one of the five. Did you? Five. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, was, I, I, I think Federica did security. Maybe it was someone else. But uh, yes, there was. it got to a point towards the end of Mastering Shiny where there were about, there were about two or three people who you could kind of rely on to yeah. uh, volunteer to do chapters and... and uh, <laughs> We're, we're down to four members I, at the moment. I'll say no that, more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, yes, so if you're close to finishing Master in Shiny, that, that, that's that's pretty impressive. So that's the second cohort, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, that is. Yeah. Good, good. No, I'm, I'm glad that that carried on because it was, it was certainly, it was a very, like, it was a very interesting book and very, I'm very glad that I went all the way through the whole book. And to be honest, if, if I'd been learning it just to build a little app or something like that, I'd have probably stopped at chapter eight. Uh, and having gone through the whole thing was so beneficial to me, you, just in terms of like career and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I'm really glad that they're carrying on with that. I, presumably there'll be another cohort this year as well. Um, I would, yeah. Have, yeah. Do you have any kind of, keynote speakers or anything planned for the end not that i'm aware of we we, we haven't reached out to anybody or, or actually Con, uh, colin is the is the uh, cohort uh, leader so i don't know if he's reached out to anybody yet um but not that i'm aware of the uh i was going to critique so within the shiny language one of the, the the statements that continually comes back over and over again is the word reactivity right or, or lazy loading this reactive call resetting your runtime etc and I haven't found an outside equivalent in a JavaScript or a, a HTML 
language to reference exactly what that implies. And the reason I'm after this is, is because within the language of Shiny, the word reactive, I'm actually still a little unsure of. I'm not exactly clear. I know what it does, but I don't know how it actually makes this reset function work. And uh, by, by taking it outside of the language into another service, yeah. um, it gives the opportunity to maybe even refer to another language's use of the term and uh, yeah. either way. Yeah, I found it quite difficult. I, 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 I presented the reactive graph or the reactive building blocks, one of those two chapters. Yes. And I, I, can't, I thought that those two chapters um, would explain the something about the the computational underpinning of mm -hmm. when an object realizes it has to update its value based on yes. whatever else and i I've, it it got so complicated that um I don't think it, I don't think I cleared it up for myself or for anyone who was attending that uh, that that meeting. Anyway, um, Federica's headed off, and I okay. Can sorry. Also, after you bet. But yes, this week. Um, yeah, uh, no, that was a really good. Um, it, it was. Good. I, I'm glad we didn't do it in one week, to be honest, because the, there was a lot more content than would have fitted in. Um, yes. A, a one hour talk, but yeah. Uh, good. Brilliant. Okay, I'll do CSS next week and I'll see you then. Um, but yeah, good luck with your final chapter in Mastering Shiny as well. Thank you, Russ. I appreciate it. I'll yeah, talk to you soon. See you. Right. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.